from SFM, uh, Meg Casting, and Deb Norston. And they'll be telling us about uh, adjusters. Well, thank you. I'm sure this is the topic you've all been waiting for. So let's move on. I'm Meg Casting, Deb Norston. We work together at SFM Mutual. As you probably saw in the bio information, Deb and I have quite a few years of experience in the industry. Um, we have worked for a variety of different claims county organizations from third-party administrators to consulting to large stock, multi-jurisdictional companies, and currently now to a regional workers' compensation company. And so what does it mean to say that an adjuster is difficult? I kind of guess what we mean when we say that is that we think an adjuster is not being responsive. They may be combative, they may be a little bit overbearing, or they maybe are not as skilled, trained, and knowledgeable as you would like them to be. So in this presentation, I am going to start off with talking about the adjuster's world. Who are they? What kind of environments they exist in? And then Deb is going to give you some specific tips about how to deal with problematic situations and to make them more amicable. So moving on, this is really from the Farmers University advertisement because they are adjusted people getting trained. So, you know, um, I certainly did not grow up wanting to be a work comp adjuster, nor did I go to school to be a work comp adjuster. And I don't know how many of you actually grew up wanting to be QRCs or getting case management, probably more in that direction than our direction. But having said that, I do think many of us probably fell into the profession, but we stayed. And, you know, why did we stay? Well, one, the compensation's okay. That's probably, you know, the one thing. Um, two, it's interesting. You know, we are all dealing with such different folks across the spectrum. Um, we're learning new things, medical and legal. Um, so it's interesting. We get to work with really overall good people. I mean, QRCs, really, you are good people, yes. Um, attorneys are good folks, physicians are good folks, and most people in the insurance industry are good folks. So it, it's a good camaraderie I think we all have. And last, and I don't want to minimize this because I think it's probably the most important reason, is at the end of the day, we all get to do worthy work. And I think that's really important to remember. We get to help people who've been injured get better and get back to being functional. And I think we should all really be thankful we get to do that day in and day out. So as far as training, um, you know, people come into the occupation with different backgrounds. Some have advanced degrees. Some have not had the opportunity to go to college. Um, you know, some people have worked their way up through the corporate ladder, maybe starting in the mail room and taking advantage of training opportunities. Some companies do have, like, universities or training programs. SFM has one. Um, other companies is totally on the job. I do think the learning curve being kind of competent as an adjuster is around three years, maybe a little bit less if you've had some more formal training. But overall, it's probably a three-year, almost apprenticeship period, I would say. So I will say, though, people with these different backgrounds just come in with different advantages and disadvantages. So, you know, when we're looking to hire people who are adjusters, what are we looking for? You know, what are the skill sets? The first thing I'll say, though, when we're looking to hire, um, I think we really need to rely on individuals, HR professionals, really, who are very skilled at behavior-based interviewing. I know the technical stuff, but other folks, probably people who maybe have um, better rounded personalities, I guess you might want to say, might have a better uh, assessment as far as how people can interact with other people. I can tell you the technical, but I'm going to rely on our HR folks to tell me about the soft skills of individuals. So the first one, customer service focus. Overall, we want claim reps who are looking to pay claims, not to deny claims. Um, vast majority of claims are compensable, so you really should be looking at it with that mindset, with that eye. If there are situations where they maybe do need to deny or it's a difficult situation, you need claim reps who have good communication skills. I always say claim reps have one of the most difficult communication jobs in the industry because it's a very broad audience they're speaking with. I mean, they're talking to injured workers of differing abilities. They're talking to employers, some who know nothing about work comp, some who are very sophisticated talking to agents who have their own agenda, talking to attorneys, talking to physicians, talking to QRCs, to regulators, to reinsurers, to other insurers. It's an exceedingly broad audience. 
Furthermore, most of the communication is over the phone. And as we all know, if you've done any sort of communication training, that's probably one of the hardest ways to communicate. If you can have the advantage of communicating one-on-one -on -one in person, you go so much further. And that's where QRCs, I think you have a huge role and advantage is that you do get that one-on-one. -on -one. And you know, just as an aside, when I was originally trained as an adjuster, I was trained as an adjuster who was supposed to go out and interview people. I'll tell you, anybody I ever went out and interviewed and talked to, they never got an attorney. So it's amazing what difference that does make. So thank you for being there to do that, to be our eyes and ears and communicator at times. Um, the other thing is often the adjuster's communication is just that one-time communication or that one claim. They don't get, you know, the attorneys, you know, kind of talk about having a fraternity of attorneys in the work comp business. They get to know each other. They get to know how attorney A and attorney B and how they interact. And that's a huge advantage. But many of us, both QRCs and adjusters, we don't have that advantage. Often it's just one claimant, this one claim, this one employer. So that communication, how it is said and what is being said from the very beginning is very, very important. And not, we don't always handle it appropriately or correctly, but we then try to correct it. And then um, I say a team player, good forethought and planning. And my point there is an adjuster is a generalist and an adjuster needs to know when something is outside of their scope. They need to know when they need to consult a physician, an attorney, a QRC, someone else, because we are generalists, bottom line. Um, but when you do need to access other professionals, then you need to have good forethought and planning and maybe thinking a couple of steps ahead of the game that I might need to talk to Dr. Doe in a couple of weeks or get this information to him now so that everything's laying out nice and timely for progressing in the claim. Duty. I think first and foremost, an adjuster has a duty to that injured worker to make sure that we are treating them fairly and in accordance with the workers' compensation law and that we are paying their benefits to them timely and appropriately. But there's also that duty to our fiduciary duty to our employer, to our company that we actually work for, to our policyholders, and then that duty then really falls to all the policyholders and all the employers in the state of Minnesota. Because at the end of the day, the adjuster needs to be determining what a case is going to cost now and what's going to cost in the future because they need to get that money up there. So today's policyholders are paying the cost versus the policyholders paying it in 20, 30 years. Because we know work comp is a very, very long tail. And we need to be able to, it's just like everything we see with the pensions these days. If people are not honest with things, what things are costing, somebody's going to be paying the price later. So we need to be honest now with what things are going to cost in 30, 40, 50 years. And then I mentioned clear thinking and analysis. I really think that's going to fall into place if these other character traits are there. Moving on, informal resources. And my emphasis here is on informal. And by informal, I mean resources that an adjuster is not having to ask permission to use. And it may be permission of the policyholder. It may be permission of the self-insured employer. And it's also maybe, and maybe the permission of their own employer insurer. But I doubt that's as much the case. Or maybe something that's not showing up on the loss cost, which means it's something that's going into the claim cost. So it's going to be impacting the policyholder and their EMOG. There's a real benefit to informal resources where the adjuster can use them when they need them. They're low-hanging fruit. And that's why I don't have QRCs up there, because while you're a great resource, you're a formal resource that we're having to pay dollars out. And we may be needing to ask permission to access your resources if it's not at a statutory time frame yet. Doctors, I really believe doctors. I'm not talking IME doctors. I'm just talking informal doctors that you can either meet with or pick up a phone and talk to to tell you is the surgery appropriate or not. You know, they're going to know much more quickly than an adjuster because you know what, hey, they have an MD behind their name and I don't. So physicians are great. Nurses can do much the same work. They can probably tell you, give you an opinion on the majority of surgeries and conditions as well as ideas and maybe alternatives for an individual. Attorneys, I think fortunately most adjusters have easy access to attorneys and most attorneys are pretty well informed and I think well intentioned on their jobs and I'm saying both defense and petitioner attorneys there. Pharmaceutical expertise, um, 
you know, with the opioid crisis epidemic and the interrelationship of drugs, having a nurse or someone available who can look at individual cases and work through the issues surrounding the pharmaceutical management is really beyond an adjuster's expertise. So a nurse is very helpful there. There are online um, resources such as MD guidelines or ODGs. These are good if you don't have anything else, but you know, so anything in the online world, it's information, it's not knowledge. And so it's better than nothing, but I think it's a poor substitute for the real thing. Now I'm going to shift gears a little bit to the adjuster caseload. Just a little bit about you know, the objective part of the adjuster's world. I would say most adjusters' caseloads probably fall in the 100 to 200 plus range. Um, I don't think there's necessarily a right number because what that number is is going to be very dependent upon how many new cases they get, what's the composition of their caseload, is it largely medical only or lost time, um, what kind of policyholders do they have or self-insured. You know, if you have a large, if you primarily serve one large self-insured who's very sophisticated about return to work, I think you can handle a larger caseload. It's just not the same difficulties as like a signed risk plan. Um, so not, not a right or wrong number there. Number of new claims, um, I would say just as probably get one to five new claims a week. And again, how those claims get assigned is going to vary from company to company. Literally in some companies it's just a round robin. It just goes from adjuster A, B, C, D until you're through with it. Um, and other companies, it may be that cases are assigned based upon a policyholder that you, you know, you serve as one specific policyholder. It may be that they're assigned based upon an agency, you work with an agency, geography. And other companies, I know that they have adjusters only handle cases for maybe the first four weeks and then it goes to a different set of adjusters if there's ongoing lost time. Again, I don't think there's a right or wrong in either one of those. I think it's really um, going to be driven and dependent upon what the policyholder or the employer is running and probably what the philosophical preference is of that specific insurer or administrator. How many jurisdictions does an adjuster handle? My personal preference and belief is two is probably the max that an adjuster can handle any competency. And that's not just because, you know, you have the laws and you need to understand the nuances of the laws, but you need to understand the players, you know, who are the providers, who are the case managers or the QRCs. You need to understand the regulatory environment. If an adjuster is handling much more than two jurisdictions, it's going to be really, really difficult. Location of the office. Um, you know, there's this saying, if you want people to be productive, have them work from home. If you want creativity, have them work in an office. And I'm talking about adjusters here because I know a lot of QRCs work out of your homes and kind of independently. But what I do find with adjusters is if they work at home, they're very isolated and they don't have access to the resources that I was just talking about earlier. Versus if you have people in an office, they can have easy access to resources and they can also get input from coworkers, managers, supervisors about, hey, I had this difficult situation, how would you deal with it? It's just, again, it makes life easier because you're there and you have people you can talk to. Finally, culture of the employer. I, I'm one of those people that I really truly believe that if an employer bothers to have a mission statement, it means something and the employer is probably trying to run their business based upon the values expressed in that mission statement. So just if you have specific adjusters who are really difficult, it might be just interesting to go online and check their employer and see if you can first can you even find a mission statement. That's the first test. If you do find the mission statement, what does it say? Is it all focused on um, productivity, on getting business, and on the financial security of the insurance company, which is important because you don't have a product without those things. But does it go any further? Does it talk about the beneficiaries of the insurance policy, which are the injured workers? Does it talk about safety? Is it more inclusive versus just the money and the business end of it? So just it's an interesting thing to look at. 
Okay, I want you to get a little blood going. So could everybody raise their finger up in the air? Okay, now start turning it clockwise and bring it down. Bring it in front of your face and you should notice that something happens. It's going the other direction, if you don't know that. Um, and the issue, what I'm, point I'm trying to make is the perspective, the per <laughs> and for, the issue what I'm trying to show is the perspective changes. And the perspective of adjusters, and yeah, see, keep on trying it, it will happen. <laughs> The perspective of adjusters and QRCs are different, and that's the point I want to make here. Just and just from the very, if you like, if you look at the latest work comp system report, and just take everything on averages, and you have a, a, an adjuster with a caseload of 100 claims, then just based on the numbers of the work comp system report, on average, 10 of those claims will not have a return to work. Now that average is going to vary a lot depending upon the policyholder. If the policyholder or the employer is self-insured, I bet you that number out of 100 is more like 1 to 2. If it's in the voluntary market, I bet you the number out of that 100 is probably more like 5 to 7. Um, if it's the assigned risk plan, it's maybe more like 15, 20. And if it's small employers, it's maybe more like 10, 15. So the expectations of adjusters is that with the vast, vast, vast majority of their claims, people return to work with their pre-injury employer. That's the majority of the adjuster's world. That the claims, most claims are compensable. There's not issues. You pay them. People get better. They get back to work. That's the adjuster's world. And the reality is, is that a lot of effort is put in trying to get people back to work with their pre-injury employer, not only because it's... It's really the best thing for everybody. Um, all statistics show that the injured worker is going to have their best recovery economically and career-wise if they're able to get back to work their pre-injured employer. So if we run into a situation where it's looking like an employee is not getting back to work their pre-injured employer, we are bringing lots of resources to bear. If that's looking like it's going to potentially happen, we're getting attorneys involved to explain the potential legal ramifications. We are running the numbers to tell the employer what this is going to cost them. We're getting underwriters involved so the employer understands how it's going to impact their EMOD, so what they'll be paying for insurance in the future. We may be getting agents involved because it's not only a situation of their EMOD being impacted, but the employer may become uninsurable in the voluntary market. They may only be able to go into the assigned risk plan. And then I think, as you all know, in some situations, employers, especially in the construction industry, if their EMOD goes too high, they cannot even bid on jobs because, of, you know, the high EMOD is just reflective of maybe not a poor, of not a good safety culture or a culture of bringing people back to work. So we put a lot of emphasis on getting people back to work with the premier employer. Now, having said that, we all know there's situations where people cannot return to work to, to their premier employer. It may be just a really bad injury, um, and or there could be a, a tough employer, a bad employer. It could be a you know problematic employee. Those so situations do arise. So when that happens, we need to make sure we have very very productive relationships. And Deb is going to talk to us about how we can make those relationships stronger and better. Thank you. Thanks, Meg. Um, I'm going to be talking more about the specific behaviors that you might encounter when working with claim adjusters. And I'm going to give it from the claim adjuster perspective. I, I haven't walked a mile in your shoes. I don't really know the rehab rules that well. I only look them up when I need to figure something out. Um, but, but before I get started, I'm just going to, I feel the need to apologize to anybody here that I might have been a difficult adjuster with. <laughs> I'm very sorry. I know that there's probably a handful in here that I've had some, uh, some heated conversations with. So anyway, um, I've been an adjuster for 27 years, and I've had an active desk as recent as two years ago. So I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be honest with what's going on in an adjuster's desk. 
and I'm going to be humble about it. So I hope with that information that you'll be able to take this and be able to work productively with adjusters going forward. Um, as Meg mentioned, there are many people that an adjuster needs to communicate with, but not only do we have to communicate with, every, with all of these various types of people, we also have to get them to work together with the end goal of restoring the injured worker's health and productivity. Um, we want to get these people back in, in a healthy status and we want to get them back to work because it's really the best for them. We want them to lead productive lives after these injuries that some of them have been horrible, horrible injuries. So, not only do we have to communicate with everyone, we have to get everyone to work together and cooperate. So I kind of think of myself as a conductor of an orchestra. And I've got all these different players playing different instruments, and I have to get them to work together to, to play something beautiful. And hopefully we haven't screwed it up and it's, it's not a hot mess. So anyway, I'm going to be talking a lot about expectations. Um, you know, the expectations of an adjuster might be a little bit different and how we can maybe set those expectations ahead of time to, to ensure the best outcome with, to the benefit of the injured worker. And I will say that you guys are valuable. You are valuable in these most difficult cases on an adjuster's desk. Like Meg was talking about, 10% of the claims maybe have no return to work and they're the most difficult and frustrating claims that we have on our desk. And so if a frustration level comes out from an adjuster, it's probably because this case is probably driving them crazy because it's not working out the way it should. So um, with that, I'm going to uh, just want to say that you, I appreciate the work that you guys do and you, your insight and the resources that you bring are valuable. And I know that there are many claims that I could not have resolved without QRC help and involvement. So I just want to um, remind that we have the mutual goal. We all have the mutual goal of restoring the injured workers' health and productivity and getting them back to work. Um, you know, we want to, to restore the injured worker as close as possible to the pre-injury activity, earnings, and productivity. And you'll find as we proceed, I'm going to kind of repeat myself a little bit over and over and over again because there's a lot of things that are kind of an underlying theme, and one of that is trust, just developing a trust relationship with one another. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is when the claim adjuster does not return phone calls or emails on a timely basis. I still believe that, at least I try to, return phone calls within 24 hours or by the end of the next business day. I still think that that's a reasonable time period. Um, but it can depend on what's going on in that claim adjuster's desk that particular day. You have to understand the world that we work in. We have time constraints just like you do and filing your forms and everything. We have to investigate and pay a claim or deny a claim within 14 days, calendar days, not business days. And we have to get these first payments out timely. We have to pay people on a regular basis. We have to pay temp partial within 10 days. We have to answer claim petitions within 20 days. Well, we have to get it to an attorney to answer it. But um, we have a lot of time constraints on our desk. So if, if Meg was mentioning um, new claims that come in, it, you know, we get one to five a week. What if we get all five of those on the same day and two of them are due tomorrow? You know, we have to kind of drop everything and get going on that so that we can get those payments done timely. So the other, the other possibility um, that can come up on a an adjuster's desk is catastrophic or death claims. When we get one of those kind of claims, we typically have to drop everything that we're doing and it takes our entire focus. It could be one or two days that we're just working on that one case. So it, it's a prioritization issue sometimes for an adjuster not returning your call and we're just, we're prioritizing what we have to do first and then we're getting to everything else later. Now I will say if you, if you call the adjuster or you send an email, make sure that if you need a response that you put that at the very top of the voicemail message or at the very beginning, you know, put the little red exclamation point on the email that, and that the adjuster, it, it's clear to the adjuster that you need a decision or that you need a response as soon as possible and perhaps give them a deadline because we, we can work with deadlines really, really well. So make sure that they know, set the right expectation for the adjuster. And I love this quote, undisclosed expectations lead to premeditated resentments. Just talk about expectations. Um, you know, what's the adjuster's preferred method of communication? It's not, it's not a bad idea to ask the adjuster when you first get a case, especially if it's 
an adjuster you don't know well and you haven't worked with very often, ask them how they like to get communication, how they like to get urgent communication, what's going to get their attention the best. Um, I am a really bad email person, like really, really bad. And I respond better to phone calls and, and verbal communication better. Um, you know, but I've been around for a while and I started before email was kind of the norm. Um, younger adjusters, adjusters who are newer, might be more responsive to email and you might not be able to get them to call you back. So it really depends. It could be a baby boomer millennial issue, I'm not sure. but. Um, you know, preparation is better than reparation. So make sure that you are prepared to, to communicate with the adjuster the way that they like to. And, and that kind of goes with, don't assume your way is the right way. Don't assume the way that you like to communicate out is the same way that the adjuster likes to communicate back. You, you might have to communicate with different people in different ways. Oh, and, and the other thing that I want to talk about about this communication thing is make sure that you communicate the important things as soon as possible. And, and the example that I have here is um, the reports of workability, especially if there's a change in, in working status. Um, when an injured worker is completely off of work and they've been released to return to work with some restrictions, make sure that, that you get that to the adjuster as soon as possible. If you sit on that for a day or two, that's not going to go well for you. Um, that's not going to go, the adjuster's not going to like that. Because sometimes employers have to take a look at what they have available. Well, you guys know this. What they have available, it might take a couple of days before they can get the job offer out to the injured worker. Another potential issue is the claim adjuster is asking me to do inappropriate things. Um, this could be just basically a jurisdictional issue. We are unique in Minnesota. I've handled other jurisdictions, and nobody handles voc rehab like we do here. So um, it's just possible that the adjuster needs to be reminded that we're handling, you know, this is a Minnesota claim, and these are the Minnesota rules. And I think it's OK for you to educate, you know, take a little time to educate the adjuster. Um, I, I, having handled other jurisdictions, I will say, Case managers in other states do ask for causation opinions. They do schedule IME appointments, and they do some even some even actually draft IME letters to doctors. So having that perspective might help you understand that maybe why you're being asked to do something that we typically don't have QRCs do in Minnesota. I um, handled the assigned risk plan claims for about a year and a half. And I spent a lot of time educating employers, those small employers who don't see work comp on an ongoing basis. I spent a lot of time educating them on the work comp process. And you know, for, especially for adjusters who haven't been handling claims that long, and I know you might not know what, how long somebody's been ha handling workers' compensation claims, you know, I think it's okay for you to educate them on how things work in Minnesota or how you know, the rehab process should work. You know, and, and by doing that, by taking a little time to educate the, the injured or the adjuster, it could allow you an opportunity to develop, to develop a trust relationship with that adjuster. And um, they will be grateful for that, I can guarantee you. Uh, an example that Mike had sent over, Mike had sent over some examples that, we could, that could help us with our presentation today. And one of the examples that he sent over was a claim adjust, uh, an example of a claim adjuster applying their company's national practices to Minnesota claims without review of our or consideration of our statutes and rules. And personally, I don't think that that's okay. I think that um, that's potentially an opportunity for you to educate that adjuster, maybe take that situation up the food chain and educate that company. Um, I don't, I think it's irresponsible for a company to go into a state and to a jurisdiction and not manage things properly and not understand the rules that they're, you know, writing the, the rules for the business that they're in the state that they're writing. So, and, you know, I would try to do that. I would try to, you know, develop that relationship with that company. And then if, if nothing comes of it and it's still kind of an ongoing problem, that potentially could be a rehab request situation. And then assume actions are done with positive intent. Um, 
this is something that I try to do, and it, I'm not always successful at it, but it's something that I try to do. To, and it, it, when I do that, when I choose to believe that somebody did not intend to purposely frustrate me, um, it puts me, <laughs> it does put me in an attitude of goodwill rather than in a defensive stance. So I will say that that can go a long way. Now, the other situation we might be having was when the adjuster is penny wise and pound foolish. And I'm, I'm going to park it here for just a little bit because of the examples that Mike sent over, there were a lot that pertain to this issue. And here's an opportunity to be a problem solver. Um, perhaps you have an opportunity to save the adjuster from themselves. I mean, I, you know, being a good adjuster, you want to take all the information in and then you have to make decisions. You have to make a ton of decisions all day long. But you want to make educated decisions and you want to consider all the factors. And by communicating all, you know, your perspective to the adjuster, it could help in, in moving the case forward. So you might want to ask yourself, how can I get more information, perhaps indirectly, to give me a more clearer picture of what's really going on here? Um, do you know all the facts? Uh, here's an example that Mike sent over. Adjusters, perhaps waiting for medical notes before authorizing prescriptions or approving the doctor's recommend recommendations. So basically what's happening here is the adjuster is not approving medical treatment until they get the actual dictation. And we know that it can take a while to get the actual di dictation. So um, what's going on? Is the adjuster you know, trying to sort out a boatload of comorbidities that may be, may be commingling with the work comp claim and they're just trying to keep the, the work comp claim separated and that's why she needs, he or she needs the dictation? Or is the adjuster missing some additional information? Or could it perhaps be that the adjuster might not be trusting that you're giving them all the information that they need to make that decision? Um, and the other thing that it could potentially be is the adjuster is a process-oriented person. And um, you know we've got people that can kind of think of the big picture and kind of move the case forward. And then we've got adjusters that like to follow A, B, C, D, and they like to process. And those people tend to be a little bit more black and white. And we all know that in work comp, we live in this world of gray. So they kind of have a tendency to kind of struggle with work comp and struggle in handling claims. But that doesn't mean that they can't learn and, and figure out how to be less of a process person and more, more of a case management type person. The other example that I can talk about here under this topic is the um, adjuster not approving the employee's mileage and thus the employee is getting an attitude. Well, we don't want to give injured workers any opportunities to have negative attitudes um, because they've got a situation that is just they didn't ask for, you know. And so um, I will say about the mileage, I, if you can at all help it, don't let the injured worker save up all of this mileage and then, you know, give a month's worth of mileage to the adjuster. That is time consuming to go through because we actually do go through the mileage logs. We actually do cross reference with the dates that they travel to the medical appointments. And when it's all given to us in these big bulks of information, it can be kind of hard to sort through and it can be time consuming. So I think two weeks max for mileage, especially if they're in job search, is, is helpful for us to kind of move that through the system. And then is there something that you can do to assist the adjuster in, in in uh, getting them all the information that they need to do the mileage. Is that adjuster waiting until all the medical bills for those medical appointments comes in and then cross-referencing the mileage with the medical bills? That's not probably a, a good way to do it, but perhaps you can get them a printout of all the doctor's appointments that they attended and then the adjuster can take that information and get the mileage quicker, get the mileage out to the injured worker quicker. And then Meg talked about the perspective spiral. Um, you know, perhaps there was some mileage abuse in the past and the adjuster is really pouring over it. Um, that could be going on here as well. And then the last example that I'll talk about in, in, this, in this topic is the adjuster not paying doctor's bills for an admitted claim. Um, and then that the doctors decided they don't want to treat the employee anymore, and so it's completely hindered the return to work process. 
Um, I would appreciate a QRC saying to me, hey, you know what, do you realize that not paying these bills is creating a huge problem with this plan? And, and is there something that you can do? do? Do you have all the information that you need to be able to pay these bills? What's going on? Um, I would appreciate that. And I think that that's okay for you, for you to communicate to us. The only thing that I can come up with that maybe is a different perspective on this issue is perhaps that medical treatment is not appropriate pursuant to the treatment parameters. Maybe it's excessive treatment and that's the reason it's being denied. The other thing that it could potentially be is it's not being billed properly or perhaps the charges are, are in excess of the fee schedule and the doctor doesn't realize that because, you know, you've got your rules that you have to you know, work within. I've got my roles that we have to work within and doctors and billing entities have their roles that they have to work in. And, you know, it is possible too that the adjuster didn't even know that there was a billing issue because I can, I just approve the bill. And then what happens to that bill after I approve it, have no idea. Um, we used to have a third party vendor that, it, that fee scheduled all of our bills. And if they held up a bill because they didn't have everything, I didn't know. I didn't always know until somebody told me. And then, you know, has the adjuster lost the overall focus and goal of the mutual, mutual goal of returning this injured worker back to work? Um, I did have a, a large self-insured employer that I used to work with, and uh, we had this horrific claim, and it, it was just, you know, it was a quarter million dollar claim a long time ago. And um, the employer was really stuck on a $200 prescription. And I was like, what are you talking about? I, we just really do not want to be spending our time talking about this $200 prescription when we've got so many more other things to expend our energy on. So because I had a trust relationship with this employer, they were like, oh, yeah, you're right. Let's move on. So that was, you know, that's an opportunity when you're working with adjusters and you've got a trust relationship with them, you know, those kind of things can happen in those relationships as well. Okay. So the claim adjuster doesn't read my report. Well, um, you know, we've got a lot of reports coming at us. We, we have medical records. We've got a lot of different reports coming out. Some are lengthy. Some can be kind of verbose. Some can reiterate activity and medical records that have already passed. And by the time we get the report, it's, it might be old news. And so we kind of just don't um, look at it that closely. Um, I will say the reports that consist just mainly of the daily entry activity notes um, can be kind of boring to read, um, but I know that you need those to justify your bills. So I think that they still should be included in your report. Um, I, I am not a detail uh, report person, um, so I'm not going to really be looking at those um, in case, unless there's an issue with billing or something. I, I want the Reader's Digest ver version. So I think the best reports are the ones that have a, a brief summary of the things that had gone on, the high-level stuff and then a plan. And that's the first thing I kind of look at is I look at the plan. What's going to happen next? I want to make sure that the case is moving forward. I want to make sure that there's proactive activity. Um, don't just regurgitate medical records in the report. I think it's duplicating work. Um, so um, the other thing is consider the adjusters that have 200 plus claims on their desk. You know, they are not going to be taking the time to take a look at a 12-page report. They can't give it a lot of time. So um, I just we just had a situation this past Friday uh, where a, a QRC report came in. And, and, and the other thing I should just kind of perspective give you is, you know, when we get medical reports and medical bills, the medical dictation supports the medical bill, we've got 30 days to pay those. Well, when a rehab report and a rehab bill come in, the rehab report kind of substantiates the bill. We still have 30 days. I mean, we have 30, up to 30 days to pay those. So, you know, with all the other time constraints that we have going on in our, in our claims, it's not really the top priority. So, um, you know, you know, don't, I, I lost my track of thought here. Okay. Um, don't put priority things in the, in the report. Don't expect an urgent matter to be responded to if you're only putting it in the report. And if you don't hear anything else I say today, please hear that. Um, because these reports not, might not be looked at for a couple of weeks. 
because it's really kind of attached electronically in our system to, to a bill. And it's a bill issue, it's not a report issue. So the other thing that you want to do maybe ahead of time is to um, find out how this, um, this company kind of processes reports. And then I'm not going to say I'm going to take my own advice and not assume my way is the right way. Some adjusters are very detail-oriented, and some adjusters do want to take a look at those reports, and they might see them right away. But for the majority of adjusters, um, you know, they're not going to be seen right away. We just had a situation this past Friday where um, count partial uh, check stubs were pages 13 and 14 of a QRC report and that was not seen timely, and the adjuster felt horrible because they didn't get the temp partial paid in time because the injured worker was calling, where's my temp partial payment? So don't, don't be hiding, and not that that was the intent, but don't be putting check stubs or anything of urgent, urgency into those reports. Um, just so you know, you know, we have an electronic process. A lot of companies are paperless, um, and so, we have indexers that process those things uh, electronically, and those indexers are not going to know to pull out those check stubs out of pages you know, 13 and 14 out of that QRC report to put it into a different process for an employee reimbursement process. So kind of along the same lines as reports is uh, adjusters not paying my bills timely. So how are you sending in the bills? And, you know, I, I did confess my email issues to you earlier. If uh, QRCs were sending me email or sending their bills to me via email, it's probable that they got lost in my inbox. Um, the best way to send in bills to SFM is to our corporate email address, which is sfmcorporateservices at sfmic.com. And then that gets into an electronic process. And, and then we can um, quickly approve those. But not every company has the same process, so it might be beneficial to you to understand what the expectations are as, you know, as you're beginning to work with a, a new company or a new adjuster. What's the best way to get those bills in and what's their process like? You know, is there further clarification needed on the bills? Um, if, if bills are audited, that takes some time. Some companies audit bills um, and uh, I don't know what that's like because we don't typically audit them that closely, but we do look at them and sometimes we need further clarification. So you might be having to send different bills in, or different, you might have, working with different companies, you might have to send in your bills to different companies in different ways, and that might be beneficial to getting the bills paid on a more timely basis. So these, these two topics are two that I kind of put together because I think they kind of go together, and this is when the adjuster, um, it, the adjuster doesn't communicate with me when, when there's an issue I don't know about or that the adjuster is doing my job. Um, start out by assuming the best. Don't make the assumption that the adjuster is frustrated. Um, perhaps it's just, you know, the adjuster just trying to, to be proactive. Um, but I think that these two combined issues really relate mostly to an underlying concern of communication, expectations, and trust. Um, start out by assuming the actions were done with positive intent and try to work through the issue with the adjuster, and that could go a long way to establishing a good relationship and, and trust with the adjuster. And please don't take things personally. Um, you know, we, adjusters have thick skins. We've had people yelling at us, and, and unfortunately some of us had, have had people threatening us, and, and so we kind of develop a thick skin, so we kind of can be a little um, tough sometimes, and we don't typically mean to be, but sometimes it's just a, a, a way to deal with, with the difficult desks that we have at, some, at, at points in time. So um, maybe the adjuster's frustrated about something and, and there's a breakdown in communication. So if you, if you maybe revisit the expectations and know what the adjuster is expecting from you, it could go a long way in, in working through these issues. Um, this is an opportunity to improve, invest, to improve in communication with the adjuster and, and make sure that you're moving the case forward and you're problem solving and you're being creative. Don't just be a communicator of information, be a problem solver. That's what we really need you guys to do.
Now, I didn't, we, you know, this isn't necessarily a problem issue, but I think that it might create, it might be something, an underlying issue of some behavior that you might see, so I want to talk about it. And I'm going to call it the, um, the elephant in the room. It's referral sources. And so one thing I want to talk to you about is maybe how might, you know, ask yourself, how might I communicate my message in a different way to get the results that I intended? You know, how you present yourself in these situations could have an immediate impact on establishing a trust relationship with the adjuster. Um, consider the perspective. So I've been working on a case, and I've been communicating with this injured worker, and I've been, you know, spending a lot of time communicating with the injured worker and the employer. I think I've got a good relationship going. I assign a QRC because clearly the injured worker needs some help navigating through the medical system. And, and we want to make sure that the, injured, the light duty work that the employer has, we want to make sure that that is appropriate and it doesn't further harm the injured worker. So I want to make sure that, you know, somebody's got their eyes on that, that light duty that the employer has offered. Um, and then three days later after I sign a QRC, they get an attorney and they get their, their own choice of QRC. Now you're the new choice of QRC and you call up and how you present yourself to me will tell, you know, will be beneficial either in kind of being a little adverse or being being helpful. So if you present yourself in a helpful manner rather than in a, hey, you know what, I'm the new QRC, that would, it would be better if you uh, did the latter, I think. Um, we just actually had a situation where an adjuster got a call from a, uh, a QRC uh, who was a changed QRC. The employer was offering light duty. Um, the, there was no consultation report yet. There was no R2. The QRC called up the adjuster and said, I'm going to start job search. Wait a minute, wait a minute. We need more information before we can do that. So that probably uh, was not um, more of a positive uh, call. But anyway, so and I know you guys are, are expected to be neutral. I know it's in the rules. However, I think adjusters forget that sometimes. And if you can just you know, reiterate how you're being neutral and why you're being neutral, maybe why you can't do something, I think that that's beneficial. Um, to reminding the adjuster of that. Okay, so with that, kind of along the same lines, if the claim adjuster alleges you're not being neutral, well, the referral source could be part of that, and I, I don't think that it should be, but it's, it's possible it could be part of it. Um, you, know, you know, what's the adjuster's frustration level? Again, these are difficult cases on our desks. And they can be frustrating when, when we think that it was going all really, really well, and then all of a sudden, what happened? Why isn't it going well? Why, why you know, and, and those can be frustrating times. So it might be beneficial to have you um, kind of take a look at, you know, consider that there was a history with the injured worker and the adjuster prior to you coming on the case. Now, you know, you have the benefit of meeting these people in person, and, I, and that's, that's valuable. But you don't understand that there might have been a history that had gone on. You know, there might be something going that had happened prior to you being on the case that might be leading into this frustration level. And then, um, you know, for an adjuster to be a good adjuster, I think they need to be objective. And I think it can be very, very difficult to maintain objectivity on cases that can be kind of frustrating on, you know, dealing with, with personalities where they can be kind of frustrating. And an experienced adjuster and a good adjuster who knows what they're doing can recognize when they've lost their objectivity. I know I've had to pull several people in a room before on it, several cases where I've been like, I've lost objectivity. I, I, I'm so frustrated with this case. I don't know what to do anymore, and then I get the experts that Meg was talking about into a room, and I, you know, I gather more information, and then I start making the decisions that I have to make. Um, but you know, neutrality and objectivity are a little bit different. So I kind of looked them up in the dictionary, and the, new, the definition of neutral is not helping or supporting either side in a conflict, disagreement, and being impartial. The, object, the definition of, object, uh, of being objective is not being influenced by personal feelings or opinions in considering and representing facts. So they're a little bit different, um, but I think if adjusters can be objective and QRCs can be neutral and keep cases moving forward, I, I, I just believe that there will be lots of success. So anyway, um, but I will leave you with this. Um, 
you know, just remember that a car in neutral doesn't go anywhere. And it, that there's, there's nothing propelling it forward. So just make sure that you're keeping the case moving forward. And I think that that will alleviate a lot of the um, frustration level of the adjusters. So kind of here are the underlying kind of things that I thought would be helpful in working with adjusters that might be giving you a little bit of attitude. And I won't read them because I think we've got some time issues here. But do you, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, my question has to do with submission of job logs or job mileage reimbursement. Um, I recommend my clients go ahead and submit them directly themselves as opposed to me sending them because I'm not sure if you're going to pay attention to them when I send my reports if they're asking, I'm not asking you to pay the bills. That is a good practice. And really, it's the same thing, I don't know if this is going on, but it's the same thing as temporary partial checks. I mean, they should be sending them themselves. They really feel like you should not have to get them all. Like Thank you. That. Yeah, and, and, you know, we see these job logs, and I have been guilty of missing those, that mileage on those job logs more times than not. Um, just make sure that the employee just indicates that it's, it's a mileage submission in addition to the job logs. Because, you know, we get all these job logs, and, you know, sometimes mileage can be missed. I, I do admit that. Any other questions? One of the things I find so often when I first meet with a client is that you were talking about mileage, don't let it stack up. I don't know how many times I've met with an injured worker who's already been through a lot of medical stuff, physical therapy, whatever, and they had never been told that they get mileage reimbursement. When I first meet with an injured worker, I bring mileage logs with me, and oftentimes they look at it and say, well, what's this all about? So I think it's helpful to help keep your mileage stacks less if somehow the uh, claims uh, person would tell the injured worker, you do get reimbursed for this. You have to submit it. So that's just a comment. Um, one of the very first pieces of communication that we send out to the injured worker from SFM is um, a prescription card, and in addition to that is a mileage log. So, and then a, you know, uh, information sheet on benefits that are due to them. So um, we, we attempt to do that. But I think that's a good reminder. So thank you. Yeah, and to kind of add to that, you know, one thing is, to think, you know, we talk about adjusters being difficult, but ultimately adjusters are hired and trained by their companies. And I do believe many companies don't do what they're supposed to be doing. I mean, paying mileage, we're supposed to do it. It shouldn't be a secret. So you can talk to that individual adjuster, but sometimes it's okay to take it up the food chain, like Deb was saying, and maybe talk to a supervisor and say, you need to do this. If you find a systematic issue, I think it's fine to take it up higher. Thank you so much. Thank you.